So we'll begin off um, this video part by discussing the Schrodinger wave equation um, and then subsequently we'll also discuss something about a particle which is in a box. So the particle in a box is a really useful problem that kind of helps us lay the foundation of where quantum mechanics is used um, and it also introduces quite a few interesting things about quantum mechanics such as the probabilistic um, interpretation of the wave function. We'll talk about that later. Um, for now, let's understand what the Schrodinger wave equation is. So say we have an equation f of x is equal to x plus 2. Then we know that the solutions to f of x are in the form of x. In this case, the solution is going to be x is equal to f of x minus 2. Right? So similarly, the Schrodinger wave equation is in this form, and the solutions to the Schrodinger wave equation, um, they're in the form of psi of x um, in one dimension. If it was in 2D, then it would be psi of x and y. If it was in three dimension, it would be psi of x, y, and z. Um, but the solutions are in the form of psi of x, um, and if there's no t, that means there's no time dependency with uh, psi, then we say that these solutions are called stationary state wave functions. That means they're stationary, they're not moving in time, um, and mostly we'll be interested in stationary state wave functions. Um, we'll also learn about time-dependent Schrodinger wave equation, but mostly we'll be interested in the stationary states. So another important thing to mention right now is that the Schrodinger wave equation cannot be derived. Um, when Schrodinger came up with the equation, he probably thought about it um, and he fit his equation to the data, which is probably what he did. Um, but the important thing is, just like we can't derive f is equal to ma, we can't derive Schrodinger wave equation anymore. But what we can do is we can show that the Schrodinger wave equation is true, um, and we can show that the Schrodinger wave equation arises naturally from other equations. So before we do that, let's kind of recap to what de Broglie said. De Broglie said that matter behaves like waves and particles. He said that matter has a dual nature. It, is, it has both wave-like properties and particle-like properties. You can't say that matter, matter is a wave or a particle. It's that matter is a wave and a particle. Um, it, it, it takes on one behavior depending on the situation that you impose it in, okay? So, you know, that might seem a little bit weird, but it's, it's true. Matter takes on one or the other behavior depending on what experimental conditions and restrictions we impose on it. So, since matter behaves like a wave, then we can say that matter waves have a corresponding solution to the classical wave equation. I'll remind you that the classical wave equation is a partial differential equation in this form. So we did a whole video series on the classical wave equation, so if you haven't watched it, I recommend that you watch some of those videos so you understand where we're building on now. So that's the first thing we need to know, that since matter has wave-like properties, it satisfies this weird-looking equation. The second thing we need to know is that since matter has particle-like properties as well, then it must also have an associated total energy, which is composed of a kinetic energy and a potential energy term. So what we'll do is, in order to um, show that the Schrodinger equation rises naturally from other equations, we'll start off with equation 1. So if we start off um, with equation 1, um, let us assume that u x of t can be written as psi of x multiplied by cos omega t. Um, so the important thing is what we're doing is we're doing separation of variables. When we have an equation that's dependent on two variables, what we can do is, in order to solve it, we can say that I can break up the equation into two parts, two components, one which is only dependent on one of the variables, and the other which is only dependent on the other variable. We did um, a whole video series in, 
regarding how to do separation of variables so I won't go too deep into it um, so I hope you can follow along um, you might be wondering why isn't the temporal portion meaning the part that is concerned with time why is there no sine term well the reason being is if time is equal to zero then sine zero is also equal to zero which would mean that the matter wave would disappear at time is equal to zero and that's not true um, matter waves are present whenever matter exists so cos zero does not equal to zero at t is equal to zero it equals to one so that's why the temporal portion is only dependent on cos um, and not on sine so moving on we'll, we'll substitute this into the paired equation which is this so I have d the second part of del, so del to the exponent 2, del is second order. Um, it's first order because it's, it's only one exponent raised, but that's not important right now. We have del squared, then I have psi x multiplied by cos omega t divided by del x squared is equal to 1 over v squared del squared psi of x multiplied by cos omega t divided by dt squared. So before I move on, I want to I mention that omega is equal to 2 pi times frequency, okay? So we did this as well last time. Um, omega is just the angular velocity. It's equal to 2 pi, meaning one circle multiplied by the regular frequency. That's how you get angular velocity. Um, so in, in this equation, um, you know, the derivative only depends on x. So I can pull out the cos omega t term. And I'm left with d squared psi of x divided by dx squared. So now I have an ordinary differential equation um, because, you know, the derivative only depends on one term, which is x in this case. On the other side, I can go ahead and pull out psi of x um, and I'm left with d squared cos omega t divided by dt squared. Now, this is also an ordinary differential equation because um, it only depends on one variable um, and not two. So moving on, cos omega t multiplied by d squared psi of x divided by dx squared. There's, there's really no change happening over there. But on the other side, the first derivative of cos omega t is simply negative sine um, multiplied by omega. Then the second, or well, the derivative of sine is cos omega t multiplied by omega. So I'm left with omega squared multiplied by cos omega t divided by dt squared. So here's what happened. So d squared cos omega t divided by dt, that's what I had. Well, the derivative of one derivative turns out to be negative sine omega t, and then I have d over dt. Um, and then I have to take the derivative again. Whoops, and there should be an omega here as well. Um, because the rule is inside derivative multiplied by outside derivative. So then I have d sine omega t divided by dt. Um, I take that derivative one more time and I'm left with d, um, sorry, minus omega squared cos omega t. So that's how the derivative happened. Um, I'm sure you know how to, how to take the derivative right now. That's not the hard part here. Um, cos omega t cancels out with cos omega t. Um, and I'm left with d squared psi of x divided by dx squared, which is equal to negative psi of x omega squared. Um, and oh, oh, sees I forgot v squared over here, divided by v squared. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this term to the other side, and I'm going to be left with d squared psi of x divided by dx squared plus um, omega squared divided by v squared psi of x, which is equal to 0. Now, I know for a fact that omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. I also know that velocity of a um, matter wave is equal to the lambda times the frequency, right? 
because usually c is equal to lambda times frequency but here since it's matter it doesn't go at the speed of light it travels at a velocity less than the speed of light um, so that's why um, instead of the c I have to replace it with a v because we're talking about non-relativistic um, speeds over here so I'm going to go ahead and make the substitution I am left with 2 pi uh, frequency divided by lambda times frequency squared and nothing happens to psi of x v cancels out with v um, and that leaves me with this equation so moving on from that now I have to use my second equation and my second equation simply tells me that the total um, energy is equal to kinetic energy plus potential energy which I'll call V of X. Okay, so that's that's another way of potential energy, another way of putting potential energy. Um, remember, one half mv squared is equal to ek. Well, what if I do this? What if I multiply and divide this equation by m? That doesn't really do anything to the equation. It's it's still the same equation. Um, but here's what happens. So I multiply and divide by m. Um, everything else is okay, the same. So I'm left with one half um, m multiplied by mv squared. Um, and I can write that as p squared over 2m. Because it's a known fact that m times v is equal to the momentum. Um, and so momentum squared over 2m is just another way of writing kinetic energy. So um, that leaves me with the total energy equal to p squared over 2m plus v of x. I can solve for momentum simply by going e minus v of x. I multiply this with 2m and I take the square root and I'm left with p. Um, it's not really important to write the vector sign here, um, but I always write it to remind you that P has a direction associated with it. So P is also equal to H over lambda. Because if you remember, um, de Broglie said that matter and waves are equivalent, so the energy mc squared of a particle is equal to the energy m over c over whoops h over c over lambda of a wave um, you can go ahead and solve that to get lambda h over mc or in our case it'll be mv because it's a it's a particle so that leaves me with h over p okay so um, p therefore is equal to h over lambda this is the substitution i made over here so lambda must therefore equal to h divided by e minus v of x multiplied by 2m to the exponent 1 half. Okay, so recall that I was left, um, I left the Schrodinger wave equation up until this point. Okay, so I have 1 over lambda squared in, in this equation. But this equation um, is only for lambda. So if I want to go 1 over lambda, then I, I do the flip, um, or I, I reciprocate it, um, and I'm left with this equation over h. So I'm going to go ahead and make that substitution, and I'm going to get d squared psi of x divided by dx squared plus 4 pi squared, um, and then divided by h squared, um, because this was lambda because I'm dealing with lambda squared, this sign, this sign disappears, um, and this gets a squared on it, okay? So I'm left with this, 2m, e minus v of x, okay? 
um, and then I still have a psi of x term is equal to zero. So stick with me. I'm, I know this might seem a little weird or maybe even hard, but it's really not that bad. Um, and another important thing to note is that I'm always going to be dealing with h um, divided by 2 pi, h divided by 2 pi. So another important thing we do um, in quantum mechanics is we introduce a new variable or a new constant, h bar, um, and that is simply equal to h divided by 2 pi. So h bar is equal to h divided by 2 pi. So what I'm going to do is this term over here, I'm going to go 4 pi squared divided by 2 pi squared and then on the bottom of this or or simply sorry I'm gonna divide this by 4 pi squared on the top and simply on the bottom 8 squared I'm also gonna divide it by 4 pi squared so on the top I'm left with 1 but on the bottom h squared over 4 pi squared is just h bar squared right because h squared over 4 pi squared is just equal to h bar squared okay so h bar is h over 2 pi um, and h bar squared is h squared over 4 pi squared so that means I can rewrite this equation as d squared psi of x divided by dx squared plus 2m e minus v of x psi of x divided by h bar squared is equal to 0. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I am going to simply, um, I'm going to do something slightly different here um, and what that slightly different thing I'm going to do is this. I'm going to divide, I'm going to, or so-called, I'm going to multiply this whole equation by h bar squared over 2m. So I'm going to go, so the first term I'm going to multiply by h bar squared over 2m. Then the second equation, I'm going to multiply by h bar squared over 2m. Okay, so when I do that, this term and this term cancel out, um, and these terms cancel out. Okay, so the reason I did that was I wanted to um, get the energy term rid of all the masses, and I want to I wanna leave that with the derivative of psi squared. I want to leave that, or the derivative of psi, that's the term I want to have the Planck's constant and mass associated with it. Um, so plus E psi of x minus v of x psi of x is equal to zero. Okay, so now I'm going to rewrite this a little bit more to e psi of x is equal to negative h bar squared over 2m. So I move everything to the other side except for e psi of x. Um, and there's a reason why we do this which I'll explain in a second. Okay, so this turns out to be my Schrodinger wave equation. Um, I, you know, if it doesn't make sense, leave it in the comment section and I'll, I'll do this again because I know there's somewhat of tricky math used. Um, we used a few math tricks. So, you know, first try going over the video once or twice, but if you think I didn't make it clear enough, let me know and I'll, I'll redo it, um, hopefully better. Um, but anyways let's move on from this. So it turns out that there's a little bit better way to write this equation, okay? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull the psi psi x outside and I'm left with this. Okay. Now I'm gonna call this part h bar um, 
which is the Hamiltonian operator. So two things, Hamiltonian and operator, probably two terms that you've never heard before. But those of you who's, who've taken a course on mechanics know that the Hamiltonian in classical mechanics is another way of saying the total energy of a system. So we know this is the potential energy of a system. Um, and it turns out in a quantum mechanical system, this is the kinetic energy. We'll talk about that in detail next or, or later. But it's important to know that you, know, you should be aware of what this is. So the Hamiltonian operator just represents the total energy of the system. Um, so this equation can be written as E psi of x is equal to, or whoops, another way of writing it is H psi of x is equal to E psi of x. So H hat is the operator, um, and this is a more convenient way of writing the Schrodinger wave equation. in operator form. Okay? So obviously I think you know one question that comes to mind is what is an operator? What on earth is an operator? An operator is simply a mathematical operation that you do on another function. So basically if I do this mathematical operation on psi of x which is some function so the mathematical operation is you know um, add v of x or sorry, it, the mathematical function is, you know, a negative h bar squared over 2m, then you take the derivative, second derivative with respect to x, you add the potential energy, um, and you multiply it by the function. Um, when you do this operation, then you get the energy of the system E, okay? So the operator is just a mathematical thing that you do on, on the function psi of x or on any function f of x. You might add, that's a mathematical operation. You might subtract, you might multiply, you might divide and so forth. So these are all mathematical operations. So simply put, this is a convenient way of representing the Schrodinger wave equation that when the Hamiltonian operator acts on the wave function, you get the energy of the system and the wave function back. Out. Okay, so nothing happens to the wave function, but you get a constant, um, and that constant is what you're what you want. In our case, it's the energy of the system. Uh, so I hope this helped. Next time we'll discuss the operators in detail. Um, and again, if the video doesn't make sense, leave it in the comment section, and I'll try to make it better.